Hey, Paul. Hey, Fab. How you doing? I'm good. Good yourself? Good. Cool. So I know that you're excited about today's topic. Which I, was, uh, I know that there's a lot of stuff you want to cover in there, which is like why, um, and you wanted to talk about why prospecting is so hard. Um, obviously, it's a big topic. You know, like I don't think there's a single silver bullet answer in there, but uh, I'll, let you, I'll let you take it from there. All right. Thanks, Fab. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think for a lot of, of people who are doing business development or trying to motivate a business development team or trying to sell their product as a company, um, we find prospecting hard. Even though even though today you've got a, a slew of amazing tools that you can use, uh, whether it's automation, uh, emails, um, uh, you know, social media, um, and and I think. I think the main reason that people find prospecting hard boils down from, and I, I, mean, I want your, your input on this, is the fear of rejection. Because when you're prospecting, just by the very nature of business and the way things are done today, you're going to get rejected a lot more than you're going to sell. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think... Uh, once you realize that and you account for that and you optimize for that, you're going to do a lot better. Um, because, you know, just think of it, it, it would be like saying, Hey, you're going to go into a room and, uh, 10, you're going to try to talk to 10 people and seven people are going to shut you down. You know, you're not going to want to go to that party. <laughs> um, so it's a state of mind that you have to adopt and, and get used to and not see it as a personal defeat, but rather as something that you need to go through to achieve your goals. So that's, I think that's the main cause that people don't like prospecting because if I could, you know, give you a crystal ball and say, Hey, today, Fab, you're going to do five cold calls you know, cold, cold calls, you know, old style cold calls. And everyone you're going to call is going to be interested in speaking to you. You'd say, oh, that's exciting. That's fine. <laughs> um, because you'd say, well, I'm going to have five conversations. You might be, you might be, you might say to yourself, oh, well, I don't have enough time to do it, but you're not going to be like, oh my God, you know, I got to go out there and, and do it. You know, prospecting sort of like um, washing your car in the rain. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, you know, it's, you, you don't feel good if the outcomes, you know, it's not a great sensation to be out in the rain getting all wet. And, but, you know, maybe sometimes you need to, well, maybe not a good analogy because you never have to wash your car in the rain, but you do have to prospect when you're trying to develop your, your business. I don't know. What are your mm -hmm. thoughts? That's my long, uh, that's my <laughs> long winded uh, three, three minute intro. Yeah, I think you're, you're completely right. I mean, it. You know, I think, and I think, I mean, you could maybe take it even a step further. I and mean, like the fear of rejection is rooted in the fact that we overvalue the opinion of people we don't know and don't care about. But, um, but you know, there is pressure, right? Like, because if you get rejected too much, not only are you getting rejected, but then, you know, your boss is also looking at your metrics and how much, you know what I mean? Like there's, there's a lot, it's a very public humiliation too, right? It's, I know you yeah. like, you like the boy girl analogies. So it's like, it's like, it's not only going out to talk to the, you know, you're in high school and you're talking to the girl that you really like to want to, but you're actually going out in the cafeteria in front of everybody and asking her and you're running the risk of being shut down in front of the whole school. Right. Yeah. Like that's, that's really what prospecting is. Cause it's not, it's not like a personal, right. Like, Oh, uh, like, you know, Paul said no to me and whatever. No, like then you could, you got to log the call in the CRM. You got to log the outcome. You got to like move the deal to lost. You got to, you know, flag the person is not interested. Like there's, it's not it's not hidden right um so i think that's yeah i completely agree i think i you can you can slice and dice it anywhere you want but I, I ultimately for most people i think it boils down to i think you, you have a fringe group of sales people that you know it's just sales is not what they want to do and they're just not motivated by they don't they don't want to sure they don't want to get rejected but they're just not motivated for to sell what you were what you're selling but I think for a motivated salesperson, I think that's the. I think yeah, that's, that, that's that's an important point actually. Um, I, your last point, you're saying like for a motivated person, you're right that, and and maybe that's another reason that 
that you have a lot of people with fear of prospecting is a lot of people go into sales because they think, oh, well, it's easy. I don't really need any skills. And then, you know, they're given the task of prospecting and then they're not even motivated to do what they're doing. So that's an added. Not only will you be rejected, but you don't really like doing sales. So uh, that can be a reason too. It's a, it's a tough job, you know, and, and I think the good salespeople realize those metrics. And they also, the good salespeople eventually figure out what it is that's happening when they are rejected um, mm -hmm. and how they can tweak and ameliorate their pitch or make whatever they're doing better to ensure that they are connecting uh, as much as possible. Right. Uh, yeah. And, and, and that's, yeah. that's, that's the important thing, right? If you're really good in sales and you're doing everything that's necessary, then you know, okay, well, I'm trying everything. It's still not going to work every time, but at least I'm doing everything I can to make it good, right? Yeah. And, um, weird. Um, I also, would have, you know, like if I could give just a personal example, like right before we hopped onto this call, I had a call with my account manager at HubSpot and we're kind of planning the end of the year together, right? And I mean, like for all of the cold call, like as much as I don't like doing cold calling, there's a motivation to succeed, right? And and that motivation helps you push through your fear of rejection. So I guess maybe you can even say maybe maybe it's less the fear of rejection and it's more the motivation to succeed, right? If you're a, a junior yeah. salesperson yeah. and and your boss is just complaining that they're not enough inbound marketing, hot inbound marketing leads, well that becomes the um, that becomes the um what's the word? The uh the story you're telling yourself, right? Like I don't, I shouldn't be prospecting. So then I wish it becomes an excuse because you don't want to get, you don't want to get rejected because at the end of the day, you're probably just not that motivated because your, your boss is relieving that motivation, right? It's like, it's marketing's fault. They're not sending enough. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you yeah. don't, it's not your fault. Your pipeline's empty. It's marketing's fault. Yeah. Marketing's right? not sending you enough leads yet. But, but yeah. so, but if, if you, you know, just to come back on the actual, prospecting itself let's assume marketing is doing its job and you're just faced with having to reach out to several different people and, and you don't know what the outcome is going to be and you're right if you're a motivated salesperson and you're really competitive with yourself and you have a goal to achieve and you know that the only way to get there is to do that prospecting even though you might not enjoy it thoroughly you'll do it anyways it's sort of like saying I'm going to make you jump in this cold water, but you're going to swim to that dock. And once you get to that dock, well, you get to have this amazing meal, <laughs> right? So if you're really hungry, you won't even notice the cold water, <laughs> right? right? And if you're not so hungry, you're going to like, oh God, it's freezing, you know, and uh, you know, it feels terrible. But you know, we've all had those times where you jumped in the water, you don't even feel the fact it's cold. Yeah. Um, and, and, and so I, I think it equates to that and just your realization of what you need to do to get there and how motivated you are to get there. That's, it's a very good point. It's, it's, am I really motivated to do what's necessary to have the success um, that's going to hopefully come from it? Because again, and, you only control your actions and your methodology, right? So yeah, uh, you don't control the outcome. So you're not dialing in those results. You're doing everything you can to get those results. Well, part of those results is, is prospecting or having access to leads if you're someone who needs to develop new business. Yeah, and I'll have like a comment or maybe more of a question because you have more of a sales background than me and you've been in sales for quite a while. But, you know, like I, I see even with a lot of people I work with, you know, like the motivation of salespeople is much more, um, you know, it's not more money motivated as much, right? Like, so I have a client that they're, you know, like I'm working with them on on having HubSpot showcase the actual value of what they're selling, right? Like, if they're not motivated by the deal or the commission, the balance or the commission that you're going to get, they're motivated by the the value that they're bringing forward to the customer, right? So we're translating the dollar amount of what they're selling to what's the actual value at the end of the day that the client will think. And so I don't know if I don't know if that's more of a new trend or if it's more of a or if it's always been like that, but um, you know, I think that's what also brings it's harder to tap in when you're doing that cold call. Is so it can feel so disconnected from from what what the value that you're bringing at the end of the day, right? Because that yeah. cold call yeah. feels yeah. so disconnected. Yeah. Um, Although if you do if you do your cold call properly, you're quickly getting to what's important to your client. Of course. To answer your first question, to answer your first question, has it changed? You know, I've been in sales for over thirty years. 
And I've got to tell you that when I started in sales and maybe, you know, maybe it's kind of sales as in, but I, I honestly don't think it was. I think it was just general something, you know, the internet was just starting. Um, the salesperson back then was educating as well as finding out what the needs were. And you're right. I mean, back then it was all about making the money and closing the deal. Um, what your client needed, I, that's not something we looked at, you know, and I, I worked under a lot of salespeople back then and I didn't like sales at first. I only did it because I didn't have to be in an office. We've had this discussion before, <laughs> you know, I realized I like sales like 15 years in, I know it took me a long time. Um, <laughs> so you're, I, I think there was a general, I think there were some people who cared about their clients and, you know, I, I think I was one of them. And I think those are the people that did well, but it wasn't something that was uh, lauded or something that was encouraged. Um, you know, you, you didn't, you didn't, they didn't teach you to care for your client. It was like, come on, just sell the freaking thing. You know? Yeah. Um, so that's interesting. And, and while we're on the topic of salespeople, uh, we wanted to talk about the two, let's say, let's say you had to, you know, let's say it's a very simple, uh, computer analogy and you've got two types of, of salespeople, you know, you polarize them. You've got at one end, the, we'll call them the evangelist, the person who talks a lot, who's sort of the, the charmer, the, uh, the, the, the used car salesman, the, the, the lawyer, the one that people often think of when they think of a stere stereotypical uh, salesperson. And I call it an evangelist, and we had this discussion before we got online that for some people it's got a, a religious connotations. And it, 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 the evangelist started out because he was pushing God, right? Um, so these evangelists are pushing their product, and they're telling you it's going to save you, it's going to do great things, and but they know nothing about you. The evangelist rarely, the pure evangelist, I'm talking about the guy who's totally polar, you know, we'll call him right, left and right. He's totally on the right. And I don't mean politically left and right, um, but he's on this side. And he is, or she is, just talking up a storm. She's like, remember those, those infomercials you'd see late night TV? Those are evangelists. Like just, they're just talking it up. You know, they're, they, they're just going to convince everyone they can that this is the product. And then you've got the other salesperson who I think uh, lives much more in the complex sale, who really wants, cares about his client, who really wants to make his client move forward or her client move forward. And the goal that they have is to help the client achieve their objectives. You know, I called, we had this discussion before, you know, uh, full disclosure, Fab's wife's a psychologist, <laughs> talked about it. And, you know, I call him the psychologist because, you know, in, in, this, in certain types of psychology, the psychologist will ask open-ended questions to find out more about what's going on. And I think a good salesperson, when he starts, when he starts at first, asks open-ended questions to make sure, and this is where it differs with the psychologist. The psychologist is not trying to sell you anything, but the salesperson is eventually, but they want to make sure that good salesperson wants to make sure that they understand your objectives and that you feel that their questions and that their, um, their drive comes from, selling that product now i think everyone's got a little bit of both right um but the evangelist is selling the pure evangelist sells his product without knowing you he just louds the and and, and, and talks to you about the wonders of his product whereas the the psychologist he he'll ask you a question or she'll ask you questions to make sure that what you're really doing is you're fulfilling a need or a motivation that the client has. And how will you do that? By giving them a product that'll help them get closer to that or a service or whatever it might be. So those are, and, and it's interesting because I kind of had this, this brain fart last week when I want to talk to you about it, is that when you get sold to by the consultative or the psychologist type of salesperson, Sometimes you don't even think you've been sold to because you just feel like this person just helped me to get what I need, <laughs> right? So you, you'll go to the car dealership and you're sold by, by a totally consult or more consultative person. You'll say, well, geez, you know, they just, you know, we know we needed a car. We walked into the dealership and they, 
they just found the best car for us because they knew what questions to ask and they found it the best thing. And other people will say, well, no, I met an evangelist. You know, he was telling me about the BMW X3, how amazing it was from the moment it came in. And he was selling it so well. I, was like, I had to buy the car. But in the end, he knew nothing about me. He was he, I bought it myself because I was so amazed by all the features and all the wonderful things that were going on. And mm -hmm. one's not bad and, and the other is good. But for sure, the stereotypical salesperson you know when you ask them well, what's a typical salesperson you know the, they'll say you know whatever a vacuum cleaner salesman from the 70s and 80s or or the 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 the, the garages and so i just wanted your take on that what what you know before we did this if i had asked you what's a typical salesperson like which category would you put them in you know i'll say something that might you might not agree with you know i, I like think that like <laughs> for for all the things that you talk that you talk about and like everybody's talking about the consultative selling you know a lot of i'm not saying you specifically but there's a lot of conversation obviously about kind of, yeah about uh like your psychologist approach whatever you want to call it is like but i still see it at the end of the day and it's going back to why prospecting is so hard is like it still seems like all gimmicky so at the end of the day you can just sell them whatever you need to sell them, right? Like, it just seems like, like, first you ask them a whole bunch of questions. It doesn't really matter. We sell accounting software. If they don't need it, you still need to sell it to them. And, and, but just, you know, ask open. And, so I think, and, and maybe it's a generational thing, but what I was mentioning before, how I'm seeing some reps, like just being just overtly motivated by the value they bring to customers. And then they're hearing, yeah, the consultative and you sit there, but then their boss is still like, no, no, you need 67 deals in your pipeline at all time and you need the cold calls and you need, you know, the, this and you need the 15 discovery calls a day uh, or a week or whatever. And I still feel from the outside looking in, right? I'm, I'm just the operations person. I'm just helping them put the things in place and just trying to see what's more efficient is that there's a huge disconnect between what we're saying, like take, take your time, ask the open -ended question, you know, book an hour meeting, try not to talk so much be there listen and and even you mentioned it like and then don't be afraid to disqualify the person but then at the, but then at the end of the day if i'm doing that and i'm sitting there and i'm like i don't i really don't think they need our accounting software you know most most i don't know, most maybe yeah, that's a, a judgment there but I'm, I'm pretty sure a lot of salespeople still feel the pressure to close them even though they don't do enterprise sales and this is an enterprise client and like you know, and the sales manager like, we'll get the dev team to build an enterprise version of it. Don't worry about it. Let's just let's just put it on the books. Um, I think, Fab, I think you're right. In I think you're right that some people. Sorry, I think you're right that some people have that dichotomy going on. Like they're being told, "Hey, be consultative," and then they, sorry, but they they. Uh, I just, I'll, I'll just, it's sorry, it's my dad. It's his 83rd birthday tomorrow. So I'm going to tell him, I will call him later. <laughs> um, so essentially, Fab, you're right. Some people have the desire to be consultative, have the desire to help, but then they're, they have the results hanging over their head saying, well, you got to sell more, you got to sell more. But I will still hold my truth that if you as a salesperson don't think that you can help that client, you're selling to them anyways, it's going to bite you in the ass. And in today's world, it's going to bite you in the ass even more. And if you're selling, if your boss is pushing you to sell to someone that you don't believe you should be selling to, if you've qualified them properly and they're still pushing you, change jobs. And I mean that sincerely, because if I'm not helping my client, if my client down the line is going to say, hey, what you did didn't really work or it's bullshit or I'm not happy, then you're you're or, or and, you know, you tried, maybe it didn't work. That's one thing. But let's say you, you knew you sell you sold something they didn't need. Then you're just a shyster. You're just you're just yeah. someone who's trying to push a product. And maybe some people feel that way. But and but. But Fab, it always bites them in the ass. If you think of those clients that you've had in the past where they're just trying to push, 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 you know, 
they're probably not doing that well <laughs> because true. they're not offering a service that really makes sense. Yeah. You know, and, and, and I know and I think that's, some, to, I, I, that's why I'm still in sales today. Cause I really feel I can help my clients. And if I don't think I can help them, I'm going to tell them, you know, you've, you've, you've got it together. You don't need me. Fortunately, yeah. fortunately, it doesn't happen often for me, but um, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm being no, but it's happened with me, right? I've had startups that were just like, we need something today. We need something tomorrow because we have an board meeting like next week. And we need to show them that we, like, I'm like, that's, that's not the type of projects that I do. Like, it's just not, you know, and, but, and, and I think, I know we started talking about prospecting and we're very far into the sales cycle now, but you know, I think that's where, you know, and I'm noticing it more and more. Um, that's where the, your rev ops comes into hand because so many people are so focused on the sales and we need to put the business on the books, but then they don't realize, especially if they're in a recurring revenue environment, that the quality of the client is much more important than the volume of the client because sending, selling a hundred clients a week and having 90 of them quit, cancel, churn before they've hit profitability for you is not worth it. Right. It's better to just have 15 good ones that stick with you, you know, because you end up with more clients at the end of the day, you know, and I think a lot of people still struggle with that. And I think, I don't know if it's like, yeah, I don't know if it's always been like that. And, and now we just have the data to support it. I don't know if it's, you know, I think, but... it's, I think it's always been like that, Fab. I think it's always been that way. And you're right. Now we just have the data to support it. Um, and listen, it's hard because sometimes I talk to people, oh, you know, even when I'm trying to help them, you know, decide on the right structure, they know what the right structure would be, but they're still going to go for the cheaper structure because it's more efficient for yeah. them to do the cheap. Well, it's not more efficient long term, but it's easier for them to do this structure, you know, now, you know, so. Yeah. so uh, I, I, but I, I will, I definitely I'm pushing back. I'm pushing back hard on the salesperson that will sell, even though they think the person doesn't need it, because uh, then you're doing yourself a disservice and, and you're not bringing your clients where they need need to go. And I think that's important. But and, yeah. and you know what, Fab? That's why prospecting is hard, because if you don't really believe in what you're selling and you're, being, exactly I was gonna say. And, and you're being slapped in the ass to or sorry, bad analogy, you're being kicked in the ass <laughs> to, to do more. Well, then you're like, I don't believe in this. My, I hate my boss. I hate what I'm doing. I don't want to prospect. But let's assume yeah. that you do like your product and you do like what you're doing. There's still the fear of rejection. Right. Yeah, but I think like we were saying at the, at the top of the show is like that can get much, it's much more easy to mitigate that as, as a leader trying to coach your team or support your team or as you as an individual to find the motivation to do it if you believe you know, if you see that what you're doing is helping, uh, you know, adds value, maybe helping to the little to come by out, but adding value, you know what I mean? Like, it's easier to be like, listen, you know, like Paul's the right fit of client, you know, like, I don't want to reach out to him, but, you know, I know I can add value and I need those numbers at the end of the day. And, but I'm not selling crap. Um, I think it's, there's, it's easier to tap into that motivation than if you're like, man, I got to call Paul. Like, I'm pretty sure he's not the right fit, but you know, I need, I need six more deals in my pipeline before the end of the day, Friday, and it's three forty-five Eastern. And, you know, I'll just call him. He'll probably leave a message and just add him to my pipeline. Right. But then yeah, that deal's know, going maybe, nowhere fast. You're right. You know, and in a B2B world, uh, you know, maybe it's a little bit idealistic. No, I think, you know, there's no such thing as a perfect product. There's no such thing as a perfect service. So often, you know, you've drank your own Kool-Aid to your company and you think you're the perfect company. So you have a little bit of that evangelistness going on, but you still have to take the time to make sure it's a good fit. And then yeah, I don't think evangelist is bad, right? No. Like you want somebody who's like willing to stand up and be proud of what they're selling. I think what you're saying is just you need. Well, you need what's the balance? Right? right. Yeah. You need to have balance. You know, if you have a pure evangelist selling a B2B product, it's, it's, it's a little, uh, you know, the, the, anyways, I, I'm not sure it's the best. And I can way. feel it, right? Like I'm obviously I like HubSpot a lot. I've been working with it for 10 years. I've been a partner now for, I don't know, two years, I guess. Um, and, and I see myself when I screw up a sale is because I went into evangelist mode. I'm like, oh, we could do this and we could do that. Blah, 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 blah. And, and when it goes well is like, when I like take the time and understand like, what are you trying to do? 
and let's let's try to build a package that makes sense for you and helps you achieve those objectives for you. Um, yeah, it, I mean, it's, it's, it's you're, obvious. You're totally right. Like two weeks ago, I was talking to someone. I was in evangelist mode because I was really excited. I knew I could help them, but I didn't. I didn't. You know, I teach this stuff, and I wasn't taking enough time to 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 listen to them. And today, I spoke to him again, and I really said, "Okay, I'm going to listen." And it made a big difference because he felt he was being listened to and it's a lot yeah. easier to, to move forward. So it's hard because sometimes you're excited yourself. You're right. Oh, I know I can help them. <laughs> and you, yeah. you just jump in evangelist mode, you know? Yeah. Uh, no, yeah. exactly. And But I mean, it's it's obviously because I think the evangel evangelist mode hides a bit of, or not hides, it's, it's too negative, but the, it's, you know, a display of that motivation, right? If you're excited about what you do, and you really believe in what you do, you know, that you have that evangelist in you. So if you can, like you said, take your time, listen to them, but also be very excited about what you're selling. I think that's where you, and that's where prospecting at the end of the day becomes easier yeah. because sure, there's always going to be the rejection, right? And that's always intimidating. It's always intimidating to stand up in front of the cafeteria. And, you know, even though you really believe in yourself, it's still intimidating. Um, Particularly when you have a stain on your shirt. <laughs> Oh, your flies yeah. open. So, Fab, uh, <laughs> that's a good point, Fab, because, you know, I think you and I really believe in what we do, right? Um, and yeah. there's still times where we don't feel like prospecting. No. So Most times I don't feel like prospecting. <laughs> okay. So, what explains that is probably, well, it's not in your character to be shut down. But seriously, if I yeah. told you, Fab, today, you know, I've got a crystal ball. And if you call these 10 people, I promise you that they're all going to want to talk to you. You probably wouldn't mind prospecting so much. So, yeah. you know. It, it, it's a rejection thing but now. Then you get, yeah. But you then that's where, like for me, you know, and obviously I'm, I'm me, I'm not every salesperson out there, but then it's about tapping into what truly motivates you, right? And, um, you know, for me, it's like I'm pragmatic. So looking at, at numbers and where I need to be and, and stuff like that, like motivates me. It's like, oh, I'm a little low here. I need to like do a bit more over there. I mean, obviously that's tied back to that intrinsic motivation at the end of the day of what I'm trying to get get to personally and professionally, but you know, like everybody's motivated slightly differently. And, and I think as a leader, obviously it's up to the rep to figure out, you know, it's their, it's their job, it's their motivation, it's their whatever, but as a leader, that's where you can really help. Cause some, especially if you're working with young reps, right? Like, I mean, especially in the world I'm in, like young reps, like, like startups, like hire these like 19 year olds or whatever that haven't sold, haven't spoken to a CEO ever in their life. And all of a sudden they have to, they have to call them or, or reach out to them, you know, like if you can help them tap into what motivates them, because when you're 19, you have no idea what motivates you, right? Like, and if you can be that mentor to them and that coach to them, I think that's where you can bring in a lot of value as a, as a leader. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I don't disagree with you. It's, it's just, um, it's a tough part of sales. And if you don't break it down, and understand the different processes and what the reactions are going to be, it's even harder. You know, I think what you and I do when we, when we sit with someone, we talk about sales process and, you know, when I teach someone about how to prospect is we are, are creating a format or a process that's going to help them have as much success as possible, but that they can also analyze what's not happening. So what makes it hard to prospect for some people is that they don't know what they're doing and they just feel like they're, you know, jumping into the operating room and they're being told here, here's a scalpel, go and, you know, operate on this person. Whereas if I give you a few guidelines, well then, you know, maybe then you'll be ready to operate, even though if it's not, even though, if you know, it's, even though, you know, it's not going to be successful every time. Yeah. Paul, this has been fun. I have to hop off. I have a hard stop in two minutes. Okay. Um, this is really interesting. <laughs> Salut tout le monde. See you next week. See you next week.